we'll talk now about sort of social cybernetics and the implications of what we've said before. And this is going to be about reflexivity. Um, <clears throat> now you can think of it this way. Uh, you have an observer, something that's observed, and the observer has an internal representation of what is observed. Or the observer can see himself observing, in which case you could say, yes, self-awareness. And then, in the case of a social system, you can imagine that each person in the society has a conception of himself and of other people and of other people's conceptions of themselves and other people. So quickly it becomes pretty complicated. Well, what is reflexivity and why is it important? I will go through three theories, briefly summarize Heinz von Forster's theory, which I've spent most of the time on, also describe Vladimir Lefevre's theory of reflexive control. He was the Soviet emigre who's now living in California. And I'll describe the work of George Soros. Here are some definitions of what we mean by reflexive. Basically, it's like an image that you see in a mirror or a relationship that exists between the entity and itself, and it involves self-reference. It's also a confusion of levels, <clears throat> or it involves an exchange of levels. Now, I mentioned before the informal fallacies. These are a collection of very large number of fallacies, which have been grouped into fallacies of presumption, which concern errors in thought. Circular causality is included there. Fallacies of relevance, which can raise emotional questions. The ad hominem fallacy is cited there. And fallacies of ambiguity, which involve problems with language, and that's levels of analysis or self-reference. So in a sense, you can say it's first-order cybernetics, second-order cybernetics, and then social cybernetics. Uh, in each case, uh, we're taking on what was previously regarded as an error of thought or analysis. So cybernetics violates all of these informal fallacies. Hence, this does not sound right. People conclude it cannot be right, and they, they have a tendency to dismiss it. But the informal fallacies are just rules of thumb. Uh, if you're interested in the subject matter, then you have to plunge into it, even if the logic is, can be confusing. So uh, von Forster first postulated the notion of second order cybernetics in the 1974 article. Lefevre's book first came out in 82. Soros' book was published in 1987, but he developed his ideas in the 60s. So Soros, in a sense, was ahead of uh, everybody else. Some basic postulates from von Forster's reflexivity theory is that the observer should be included within the domain of science. And a theory of biology should explain not only digestion, reproduction, maturation, evolution, but also cognition. So that a theory of biology should be able to explain the existence of theories of biology. That's what cognitive science is basically about. There's the notion that a reality is a personal construct and that individuals bear ethical responsibility for the world as they perceive it. Okay, now, let me talk about Lefevre's theory. So this, I'm now talking about Vladimir Lefevre's work. He is, uh, uh, or was, a Soviet mathematician who was engaged in strategic analysis. That is, he was working for the military in the USSR on problems of strategic thinking. Uh, and he was dealing with the issue of what do we know about what they're doing? What do they know about what we're doing? Uh, what do we know about what they know about what we're doing? What do they know about what we're doing, about what they're doing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you can go up in as many levels as you want. He decided that three was probably enough. <clears throat> and he created a mathematics, uh, a kind of exponential mathematics. Um, it looks like this. Three 
three levels is about right, is enough. Now the question is, what is the combination rule? Is it multiplication? Or is it addition? Depending on whether you choose this to be a times or a plus, you get two different ethical systems. You get two different sense, uh, sets of uh, assumptions about the relationship between means and ends. Either uh, the end justifies the means or it does not. If you emphasize method, that's the first ethical system. If you em emphasize the end, that's the second ethical system. So he associates the first ethical system with the West and the second ethical system with the Soviet Union. However, both systems exist within any society. And as soon as you make a decision to go to war, you're moving in the direction of the second ethical system. Because in the second ethical system, uh, the notion is that any means necessary is justified. So that in peacetime, thou shalt not kill. But in war, that's what you're trying to do, is to kill them before they kill you. Uh, an example of this is the movie Platoon. Uh, in the movie Platoon, there are two sergeants, Sergeant Elias and Sergeant Brown. Sergeant Elias is a representative of the first ethical system. Sergeant Brown is a representative of the second ethical system. And these two sergeants are at war for the loyalty of a private. And he feels that his mind is being taken in different directions. Because one says that even in war, some things you just don't do, like abuse the civilian population. And the other sergeant says that in war, you do whatever you need to in order to win. So you can compute uh, guilt, suffering, and ethical status uh, using Lefebvre's theory. Uh, in the first ethical system, a saint is willing to compromise and has low self-esteem. A hero is willing to compromise and has high self-esteem. A Philistine chooses confrontation as low self-esteem, and a dissembler chooses confrontation as high self-esteem. In the second ethical system, it's the reverse. So that a saint or a hero confronts, and only a Philistine or a dissembler compromises. You may remember, uh, I think it was, must have been in the 50s, when uh, Khrushchev went to the United Nations and started banging on the table with his uh, shoe. And most of the people in the... Uh, auditorium thought that was highly inappropriate behavior. It was ungentlemanly, you know, to disrupt the proceedings in such a way. But if you feel that the United Nations is a tool of the capitalists and that the capitalists are exploiting the workers, then your willingness to confront the exploiting system is heroic. Okay? So he could see himself as being a very heroic actor because he's confronting a corrupt and exploitive system whereas others thought he was just being <laughs> very rude. So according to Lefevre, there are, there are two systems of ethical cognition, and that people are imprinted with one or the other ethical system at an early age. You learn this very early. And that throughout your life, your first response is always to act in accord with the ethical system you first learned. However, you can learn that there are two ethical systems, and when one of them is not working, you can then shift to the other ethical system. I'll explain to you how this worked in, uh, in a very minor case in uh, my experience. I was arranging meetings between Soviet and American scientists, and there was a gathering in Vienna, and we had gone out for dinner, and we were loading up our plates from the table. And one of the Soviet scientists uh, came over to me and was pressing on me to do something, arrange a meeting or something like that. And so, and I was saying, yes, well, you know, I'd like to do that, but I'm very busy. And then he would press me some more. And I would said, well, I'd like to, but uh, I'm just not sure I have time this year. And he'd press me some more. And so I thought, this isn't working. <laughs> So I said, okay, I'm doing the first ethical system thing. I'm trying to compromise. He's doing the second ethical system thing. You know, he's, he's 
confronting. So I said, I'll just switch over to the second ethical system. So I put down my plate and I said, look, I'm willing to do this. I'm not willing to do that. He says, oh, okay. <laughs> and that was the end of it. So when you encounter somebody that's using the other ethical system, you can step outside of it, do, a, do the confrontational thing uh, in this case, and then you're understood. If you don't, then <laughs> it doesn't work, and vice versa. This is similar to the, art, to the discussion we were having a moment ago when we were talking about the fact that people may uh, be stuck in a view that says that their interpretations of the world are the way the world is rather than in viewing them simply as interpretations. And this is a very similar notion. This is reflexive control. This is being aware of your way of seeing the world, being aware of an alternative, and then choosing which to use to achieve the goal that you're trying to achieve. One way of interpreting Lefevre's theory is to conclude that the Cold War was, at least in part, a case of cross-cultural miscommunication. That is, each side would present itself as being a person of high ethical status and would come across as a person of low ethical status in the mind of the other party. This happened particularly when Kennedy met Khrushchev at Schoenbrunn Palace in Vienna early in Kennedy's presidency. Uh, Khrushchev came across as being very aggressive and very demanding and Kennedy came across as being, well, maybe you have a point, maybe we could work something out, etc. Khrushchev was using the second ethical system, Kennedy was using the first ethical system. And as a result of that, Kennedy came out and said, I never met a man like that before. He knew that he had given an impression of weakness to Khrushchev and that he would have to stand up to Khrushchev and he chose Vietnam as the place to do it. Khrushchev came out thinking he could bully Kennedy and so he thought it was okay to put the missiles in Cuba. But it was a matter of miscommunication in terms of Lefevre's two systems of ethical cognition. So when the Soviet Union was collapsing in the late 1980s, this theory was available and was known on both sides and was being studied at the highest levels on both sides as a way of preventing miscommunication so there would not be a nuclear exchange, as they call it. The theory was not used in Yugoslavia. Now, I was a visiting scholar under a Fulbright at the University of Sarajevo in the spring of 2004, which was almost 10 years after the end of the war in Yugoslavia when Yugoslavia came apart and they had this terrible um, genocidal war. And during, that, during my time in Sarajevo, I presented a number of theories of organizational behavior, of which Lefevre's theory was one. <clears throat> and at the end, I asked the people who were middle managers, many of them worked for businesses, of everything that I've said, what was the most interesting? And to my surprise, they said Lefevre's theory virtually unanimously. And I said, why? They said, well, first, it explains why the war happens, happened. And second, it explains why we can't get along even now. Because one side, namely the Serbs, were using the second ethical system. The other side, the Bosnians, were using the first ethical system. And they just were misunderstanding each other rather dramatically. At the present time, Lefevre's theory is very, very popular in the former Soviet Union. Uh, the Institute of Psychology of the Russian Academy of Sciences has an annual conference on reflexive control. And they have a journal that's published both in English and in Russian called Reflexive Control, which is about Lefevre's theory.